Around a month ago, I received a rather generous donation from a fan of the channel. That's putting it lightly. He sent me over an ASRock X299 OC Formula motherboard and an Intel Core i7 7820X 8 core CPU. So, Claw over on the Patreon, you freaking rock, man. But as I'm getting ready to put this PC together, I decided to investigate a question with it that's been on my mind recently. When it comes to keeping your PC cool, are we overthinking how to do it? Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff, and I'm going to be doing a bit of an odd comparison today, but stick with me, I think the results are going to be worth it. Now, the point of this video is to not make any sweeping proclamations one way or the other. Go air-cooled or go water-cooled. I'm not gonna be able to answer that question with a sample size of two, but I wanted to at least put the question into your brain so you can start thinking about it. Now, on my right are two very different coolers. One of these is an entry-level all-in-one liquid cooler, the Thermaltake Water 3.0 Extreme S, and a, what I'd call a mid-tier air cooler in the Riva Naranos. Now, common knowledge in the CPU community right now, and really for about the last decade, is to cool down your CPU, you either use the stock AMD Wraith, a Hyper 212 Vivo, or some of the top-tier offerings from Noctua or Be Quiet if you want to go air-cooled, or you go with an all-in-one liquid cooler or a full custom loop. I think most of the allure of AIOs is water cooling has always been seen as elite. It's the most extreme and effective way to cool your system. And it's just a little bit dangerous. I mean, your computer's not supposed to get wet. That's how things break. And we all know serious PC enthusiasts take risks when building systems for the best gains possible. But hold up a minute. AIOs were designed to bring water cooling to the masses in a safe and efficient means. And while there were definitely significant performance increases when the technology was introduced over a decade ago, it's not like air cooling design suddenly just stopped. And case in point is right here. The Thermaltake AIO is sitting at $95 on Amazon today and uses the tried and patently true Asatec design from yesteryear. Meanwhile, the Uranos is a 140 millimeter tower cooler with six heat pipes and an aluminum fin array to dissipate heat. And if mass is any indication, this should be able to dissipate a metric ton of it as the cooler weighs over a kilogram with the fan installed. That would be 2.2 pounds in freedom units. And what's more, the Uranos is just $60 on Amazon right now. And you can add a matching fan for a push-pull configuration for just $17 more, bringing the total to just 77 bucks. Regardless of any performance metrics I give you today, there are some tangible benefits of going with an air cooler over an AIO. For example, if the pump decides to give out on your water cooler, there's no backup for that. The CPU block on its own actually doesn't dissipate that much heat, and without water movement, you could pretty quickly reach thermal shutdown temps. Air coolers have a much lower likelihood of failing, and even if we lost a fan on the air cooler, the tower would still provide some level of cooling to your CPU thanks to the airflow from your case fans, giving you at least proper time to shut down your system if needed. Before I install this board into a case, I'm gonna be testing both coolers on my open air test bench here, otherwise known as the box the motherboard came in. As much as I like water cooling, I've been wanting to do a good looking air cooled build for quite some time. So does a $60 air cooler perform as well as a $95 all in one? Let's find out. Six and a half hours later. <sighs> good morning. All right, now let's get started. So I think we're gonna start with the Thermaltake Water 3.0. Now, for those who are wondering why I usually don't bench test my gear before I put it into system builds, why I just usually go for the system builds, it's because setting up a test bench takes almost as long for me as just putting it in the dang case. So if there's a problem, yeah, it's gonna take me about three more minutes to take it out of the case, but if there's not a problem, I'm saving myself 15 to 20 minutes. So it, it's a risk reward thing. And honestly, I don't see that much equipment fail. See that much equipment. Fail. See that much equipment. Fail. Alright, test number one. Of course, if this motherboard doesn't work, this is kind of all for naught. This may be very quickly how to troubleshoot a dead motherboard. I'm only seeing double zero on the postcode. It's not moving at all. Well, I got one CPU fan back. This one's still not spinning. Pump isn't working. This isn't looking good. Two hours later. So the new plan after all of that, uh, there's something wrong either with the, uh, the, the X299 ASRock OC Formula motherboard or my 7820X. I'm not sure what is going on with that board, but I spent almost two hours this morning trying to troubleshoot it. I'm done. 
Moving on, uh, we're gonna be moving on to my Gigabyte Z370 XP SLI motherboard with 16 gigabytes of Corsair Vengeance LPX 3200 memory. I do have my i7-8700K in here and we'll be testing at both stock and overclocked speeds. I have dialed in an overclock of 4.8 on this board before, really just playing around though. I think I'm gonna try to hit five gigahertz just to really run these coolers through their paces. We're gonna start with the Thermaltake 3.0 water, see how that runs, and then move over to the Uranus. So let's finally get to testing. And here we are finally inside of Windows. Uh, I've got the i7 at stock speeds running with the Thermaltake uh, 240 mil AIO. And right now I'm just collecting an idle temperature. Uh, we've been jumping back and forth between 28 and 29 degrees Celsius. I think I'm just gonna call this 29. That seems to be where it's, uh, it's nice and happy with. For our stress test, we're gonna run IDA64 and I'm just gonna stress the FPU. That's uh, pretty much gonna get us our max possible temperatures on this CPU. And like I said, I, my goal is to really stretch the legs of both of these coolers to find kind of a worst case scenario. So here we go with the Thermaltake i7-8700K at stock speeds. So as you can see with the CPU at 100%, we're seeing a 4.3 gigahertz max turbo across all cores, which is exactly what I would expect to see. We are seeing right around 68 degrees Celsius right now is the max core temperature. We are definitely gonna let this just equalize. Water takes quite a bit of time to actually get up to temperature and then reach its, its max, max saturation point. Excuse me if I could talk today. Uh, so we're gonna let that completely equalize and then we'll take our reading, then we'll uh, reboot this and see how far we can push our overclocks. While Gigabyte does have a built-in profile for 4.9 gigahertz, I'm a little bit concerned with the voltage because we're sitting right around 1.40 volts, uh, bouncing between 1.385 and 1.40. It is holding 4.9 gigahertz, but uh, I can't imagine this is gonna run all that chilly. Well, we've only gone up in idle temps uh, about two or three degrees. We're sitting right around 31 degrees Celsius now, but I wonder what happens when we actually put a load on this thing. And here we go, against my better judgment. <laughs> so immediately shooting to 92 degrees Celsius yet again, 89, 88. Holding that 4.9 gigahertz mark though, at what seems to be uh, 1.33 volts, 1.337 there. So definitely more my taste in, in the voltage range. So we went up about 600 megahertz on this chip, which should give us about a 12 to 15% performance increase. However, as you can see, we're also sitting at 98 degrees Celsius right now, which is way hotter than you should ever run this chip. I know it doesn't thermal throttle until 100 degrees, but just for longevity's sake, don't run your chips this hot. So yes, we're stable at 4.9 gigahertz, at least on the outset of this test. Uh, I'd really want a much longer test before I called this stable, but that is not a temperature I am comfortable with. So I don't think five gigahertz is going to be even close to achievable with this cooler. So I'm starting to see some weird readings in the temperature. As you can see, the CPU is sitting somewhere in the 90s, but we're also dropping down pretty randomly down into the 30s across all cores, 40s and 30s. Uh, now IDA64 is not reporting any throttling, but I think we're kind of reaching that throttling limit. Again, we are sitting 95 degrees Celsius when this thing's under full tilt. So. Uh, I think we're throttling even if it's not saying we're throttling. So I'm gonna call 4.9 a no-go on this cooler. So what do you say we move on to the Riva Neuranos? So one thing I will say, uh, one of the big disadvantages of going with a water cooler in a lot of systems in a lot of modern cases is actually the fact that they don't seem to think about cooling the rest of your motherboard. Your motherboard still needs airflow. Uh, in particular your VRMs and your, your uh, chipset heat sinks. Um, I can tell you right now, this heat sink is too hot to, to hold, to, to hold my hand on. Um, it is quite toasty, like to the point where if I held my hand down on it, it would probably burn me. Um, so keep that in mind when you are going with a water cooler, you still need airflow over the top of your motherboard to help keep it cool. So here is the Riven Oranos. And I gotta tell you, this is one heavy box. Like I said, this is a one, almost 1.1 kilogram uh, cooler. And it is every bit of that. Really digging the top on that. 
Those are some thick aluminum fins, massive heat pipes. There's uh, two, what are the six millimeter heat pipes and then four four millimeter heat pipes, it looks like on here. Uh, very nicely capped. Oh, that is just a beauty. And included in the box is also one 140 millimeter uh, called a cold wing fan. This runs anywhere from 300 to 1700 RPM. Uh, really nice looking fan as well. Sticker's even nicely centered on it. That's one thing I always like to check for. <laughs> so again, this configuration right here is only $60 on Amazon right now, uh, but I have really high hopes for it given just the mass of this. I mean, you can't judge a book by its cover, you can't judge a hint sink by how heavy it is, but you can make a pretty educated guess. That is one solidly mounted cooler. I like that. There we are, stock speed's running at about 32 degrees Celsius. One thing I will say, this thing is barely above a whisper. Now, while the thermal take stayed quiet pretty much the entire test, the pump was audible and the fans did ramp up slightly. Um, I think those fans maxed out at about 11 or 1200 RPM. Uh, this can ramp itself all the way down to 300 RPM and Quite honestly, I can't even hear it when my, my ear is that close to it. I hear the graphics card little fan on the EVGA Superclock more than I hear this fan here. So the fact that we're keeping close to even with the uh, the thermal take over water is pretty impressive, just uh, first impressions. So there we pretty much leveled out. We're bouncing between 29 and 31. The max we hit is 31. So I'm gonna go ahead and call that 30 degrees Celsius for an idle temp. And of course, I've been working on this so much of the day, the lighting has completely changed outside on me. I'm gonna go ahead and move my studio lights here real quick. There we go, got my balanced and diffused lighting back in place. <laughs> All right, so Ida 64, FPU stress, start. So right off the bat, our CPU fan ramped up pretty much to its max. It's sitting right about 1500 RPM right now. It does max out about 1700, but uh, it's, it's definitely audible. Uh, inside of a closed case, this might not be so bad. And if that's the max it ever got, honestly, that would be just fine. Uh, it, it's actually not that loud, but it is noticeably louder than the thermal take. But I will say, temperature wise, seems to be pretty competitive thus far. The nice thing about air coolers is they pretty much equalize almost immediately. Uh, once you put a load on them, it doesn't take much for the, uh, the heat pipes in there to reach their max temperature or their max dissipation. Uh, so we're gonna reach our equalization point here pretty quick. We don't have to wait for the water to heat up inside of a loop. Uh, and as you can see, we're sitting right at 68 degrees Celsius, 69 just, just hit. So pretty much have matched the, uh, the thermal take output. Let's go ahead and let that run for a while. I, I just wanna make sure that uh, we're not gonna go any higher, but so far we're dead heat with the thermal take. So what is it I'm doing to uh, pass the time? Same thing you were all doing, playing Red Dead Redemption 2. My Arthur is a bad man. So that's been running for just shy of 10 minutes now. And as you can see, we've got the same 4.3 gigahertz all-core turbo that we did with the thermal take at stock speeds. And also, as you can see, we've pretty much matched the control. Uh, we're, we were at 69 degrees Celsius for the thermal take. We're at 70 degrees Celsius for the Reven. Like I said, slightly louder, but inside of a closed case, you wouldn't hear this fan. It's really not that loud. Uh, and quite honestly, I'm very, very impressed with the cooler so far. But I also have one more thing that I wanna show you guys with this cooler. I do have a second fan, uh, a second gold, cold wing. I think I called it a gold wing before, that's a Honda. I have a second cold wing 14 fan that I wanna throw on the back of here to get us a push pull and see if our temps improve even further. Well, I was going to show that, but unfortunately it's not gonna fit on this machine. So I might have to flip this uh, to a vertical arrangement. Crap. Now we'll see if we can uh, make it work. Although I think this whole thing is offset. I think I can actually spin this whole cooler around. I think I might've put it on backwards with that mount. Yep, I did. A few inches later. So we're seeing the same, uh, as it jumps up to 48, <laughs> Uh, the same right around 30 degrees Celsius idle that we saw with the single fan, although now that we have the dual fans on, that thing just looks badass. That's a good looking cooler. Anyway, so same 30 degree idle temp. Let's go ahead and start up Ida 64 again and let's see where our load temperatures get us to. 
There we are, as you can see, again, air coolers equalize nice and quick. We're sitting, we hit a max of 69, but we've been sitting closer to that 66 degrees Celsius range. Like I said, we do spike upwards of the, the 69 and 70 degrees Celsius, but we're sitting probably two to three to four degrees cooler than we were with just the single fan setup. And I gotta say, this is not that much louder than just the single fan. Uh, that's a really nice way to, to do this. I'm pretty satisfied with that. What do you say we reboot, go back to the 4.9 gigahertz at 1.337 volts and see what this thing does now. And again, we're running the single fan because I wanted to see one fan versus two fan configuration because those are two very different prices. So let's go ahead and get this show on the road. So we reached the exact same 98 degrees Celsius mark that we reached before. Uh, one thing I'm not seeing though, is I'm not seeing our temperatures drop down into the 30s. These are staying pretty consistent. So, and in fact, we're sitting right around 95, 94, jumping between 94 and 97 degrees Celsius with a peak of 98. So I'd call it a dead heat with the, with the liquid cooler, maybe slight advantage to the air cooler, simply because I'm not seeing any, anything that would make me think this CPU is throttling at all. Still way hotter than you should run though. What happens when I add a second fan to this mix? Do we get any better results? So that's nine minutes in and some interesting results. We're actually seeing a lot of the temperatures down in the upper 80s. Uh, again, our, our max temp is sitting right around 95, but most of our temps are significantly lower than they were both on water and just with a single fan. That is an interesting result. So where does that leave us? Well a little bit darker since the sun keeps going down. <laughs> there we go. So where does that leave us? I've always had this, this feeling, this inclination that a lot of the modern entry level all-in-one liquid coolers are kind of over-engineering a solution to cooling your CPU. Honestly, just putting a large tower cooler on your CPU, something like this, and this isn't terribly expensive for an air cooler. Again, single fan, $60, dual fan, 77 you're significantly less than an all-in-one liquid cooler, much fewer points of failure. Uh, again, one of these fans could die and I'm still gonna keep cool. I probably wouldn't even notice the difference. Both of these fans could die and the tower is still gonna provide some cooling, especially if you have adequate airflow coming through your case already. Versus if a pump dies, you're pretty much screwed right away. But for less money than an entry-level all-in-one liquid cooler, I'm getting the same or better performance, uh, both acoustically and, and performance-wise, as far as temperatures go, in honestly, a very, very nice looking package. But what do you guys think? Uh, do you think water cooling's overrated? I certainly do, especially at the bottom end of things. Now, obviously I am a fan of custom water loops as I've got a couple of them here on my desk. And at the top end of things, when you're spending the, the four, five, six hundred dollars, it's certainly worth it. And if you're going for some of the more premium all-in-one liquid coolers, uh, such as like a Fractal S36 or, or something to that effect, there is something to be said for water cooling versus air cooling. But I think for most people, something like this would be just fine and probably leave you with a lot fewer headaches. And right as I was getting ready to sign out, I realized I've been doing this entire afternoon without anything in my hand. So I went ahead and poured myself a little snifter of a James T. Kirk straight bourbon whiskey. It's a 12 year bourbon whiskey in honor of the man himself. I think next week we're gonna put all of this into a case, obviously with a little bit better graphics card, not my uh, GTX 1053 gig, but put this all into a case and see how well it performs inside of a case. And I'll kind of take you along that journey. Like I said, I've been wanting to build kind of a beefy air-cooled system for some time. As much as I like my water-cooled systems, it is nice just to get back to simplicity of building machines and having them perform well without much headache. Anyway, that's gonna come next week. I'm gonna sign off for now. Thank you guys so much for watching this one. And as always, we'll see you in the next video. Cheers, everyone. Mm. Oh, so good.